Vlad the Impaler was so brutal that he was immortalized as a guy who likes to suck blood out of people's bodies by Bram Stoker in his book Dracula. And yes, I'm not in my usual studio, I'm on the road for the next five weeks, so this is what it's gonna look like for the next few videos. Also, the vampire Dracula is not what this video is about. Vlad the Impaler's reputation is that his home was this big spooky castle in Transylvania, which he never actually owned, and for good reason. I mean, one time, a bunch of diplomats visited Vlad for a friendly conversation, and when they refused to take off their hats because of religious reasons, he declared that they wouldn't ever take off their hats again, that they would wear them eternally, and then had their hats nailed to their skulls. So I want to be clear right off the bat that that level of brutality is never called for or right on any level. But, but, and don't hate me for this, I kind of understand why he did what he did. Just hear me out. You might agree with me after this that Vlad the Impaler may have been kind of a hero. So Vlad was the ruler of a kingdom called Wallachia, which today is in southern Romania. This place had been at the center of war since the beginning of time. It was ruled by the Romans, the Mongols, the Goths, the Huns, and finally, people got sick of always being under someone else's rule. And in the 1300s, a man named Basarab I rebelled against Charles I, the Hungarian king who ruled over Wallachia at that time. He succeeded in making Wallachia its own kingdom, which was a glorious breath of fresh air for the constantly oppressed people. So when the Ottoman Empire rolled through and took over in the mid 1400s, subjecting the people of Wallachia yet again, it left a bad taste in their mouth. Make sure you remember those things as this story goes on because it helps to know that in Vlad's mind, everyone wanted to rule Wallachia and oppress his people and always had. Vlad himself was born in about 1431 in Transylvania, although that wasn't his home and he never actually owned any land or anything there. His father was Vlad II, our Vlad is Vlad III, and he was the king of Wallachia. During the reign of Vlad II, Vlad the Impaler's father was constantly dealing with the fighting between the Muslim Ottoman Empire and the Christian Europeans. The lands of Wallachia and Transylvania were right right smack in the middle of these two mega powers and were used over and over again as battlefields in their wars. This meant that the Dracula family's people and lands were getting caught in the crossfire. They were getting killed, wounded, hurt, having their crops trampled and eaten by these enemy armies and there was nothing they could do about it. Then Vlad II gets invited to a meeting with the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, Sultan Murad II. Not suspecting any foul play, Vlad II and brings his two sons, Vlad III, our Vlad, and his other son, Radu, along for the meeting. We can all assume that when Vlad and sons arrived, Sultan Murad II was sitting in a swivel chair with his back turned when they arrived, and when they entered, he slowly turned while ominously petting a cat as he greeted them, because the whole thing was a setup. Sultan Murad had them all arrested, and only allowed to let Vlad Dad go home once he promised to abandon his children and let the Sultan Murad and his Ottoman Empire raised them. So our Vlad becomes a captive of the Ottoman Empire and he's held there for years. He was most likely tortured during that time and guess what, plot twist, it was during those formative years when Vlad was an impressionable young man that he would have witnessed impaling for the first time. The Ottoman Empire had been using impalement as a punishment for crimes like highway robbery and rebellion. The Egyptians were also known to just impale people willy-nilly in those days. Vlad learned about impaling as a form of execution from them and saw that impaling was so grotesque and struck so much fear into the heart of the people that saw it that it was extremely effective and deterring others from committing these crimes. Vlad spent five years with his Ottoman captors until his father was killed by local warlords in 1447. And then his older brother, Mircea, was captured, had his eyes gouged out, and then was buried alive. After all of this, Vlad was released from prison, but Wallachia was then being ruled by a guy named Vladislav II. I know it's a lot of Vlads and it can be hard to keep track of them, but we'll do our best. Nobody knows 100% for sure how Vladislav II became the ruler of Wallachia, but it's mostly believed that he was the one who orchestrated the assassination of Vlad the Impaler's father. With his father and older brother dead, Vlad III now had a right to the throne of Wallachia, but 
but now he had this Vladislav guy claiming that he was king. So Vlad pretended to be super loyal to the Ottoman Empire. And since Vladislav was launching a campaign against the Ottoman Empire, Vlad had a bargaining chip with the Ottomans. There was some back and forth for a time where Vlad the Impaler moved against Vladislav II while Vladislav was out fighting the Ottomans. And Vlad the Impaler took the throne for a time, but he couldn't hold it because he didn't have the power yet. And he ended up having to go into exile in Transylvania, where he became the defender of the borders. All of this is how he became associated with Transylvania. But in 1456, while Vladislav II was on a war path, Vlad the Impaler secretly moved into Wallachia lands with the backing of the Hungarians. He intercepted his father's murderer, Vladislav II, by surprise, but he didn't attack right away. Instead, he probably said something along the lines of Inigo Montoya and the Princess Bride. Hello, my name is Vlad Dracula. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Vlad the Impaler and Vladislav II fought for the entire kingdom in a one-on-one -on -one duel in what must have been a pretty epic battle. Our Vlad won the fight and lopped off the head of Vladislav, solidifying himself as the new ruler of Wallachia. This is where Vlad starts to get his bloodthirsty reputation because the first thing that he does as ruler is send out armies against those warlords who mercilessly fought against his father and also squished his brother's eyes and buried him alive. He had thousands of these warlords and their people executed and sweetened the pot for his people by allowing those who fought with him to keep all the loot. He also invited all the other local lords and ladies who had supported his family's killers to a royal banquet. They all foolishly actually showed up and he had them stabbed in their seats at the dinner and then impaled in front of everybody. His goal was to show everyone, you don't mess with Vlad. Once those internal enemies were wiped out and Vlad had a solid foothold in his own land, he found himself not only ruling this kingdom that was already tattered from generations of war, but that he was also surrounded by threats on literally every single side. One border had the Saxons who were essentially German Vikings and loved to invade places Places and loot. And on the other border were the Hungarians who were growing in power really fast. While they had helped Vlad gain this initial power, their goal was to rule over Wallachia themselves. And we're considering moving against Vlad to support Vladislav II's brother, Dan III, because they didn't trust Vlad. And then of course, the Ottomans who raised Vlad in his teenage years were expecting him to be loyal to them. So no matter where he turned, people wanted his land, wanted to kill him, or wanted him to serve them. And they were all way bigger than him. His kingdom had no chance to win against any of their armies. Oh, also, both Hungary and the Ottoman Empire demanded that Vlad pay them tribute and taxes. The Ottomans also demanded that Vlad send grain and soldiers to support their armies. And Vlad, whose kingdom was already barely hanging on, was scraping together all of these tributes and actually paid them at first. But then things started to unravel pretty quickly. A group of Saxon merchants robbed a bunch of Wallachian merchants of their steel. It was a big conflict on the Saxon-Wallachian border at the time. And once this happened, Vlad pretty much snapped. He decided that he had had enough of all of this nonsense. So he captured these merchants merchants. And as was the Ottoman sentence for robbers, he impaled the merchants. But he took it a step further and impaled their wives and children as well. While this whole thing was happening, the Hungarians and Transylvania decided to support Dan III, and he was invited to Wallachia to try to take it over. So Vlad, he's trying to put out one fire on the border, and then another bigger one is breaking out back home. So he marches back and has to fight Dan III. He ends up killing Dan III in battle, once again solidifying himself as king. But now he has to deal with the Hungarians and Transylvania, so he decides to make a statement. Because he knew he had just made the Saxons mad, and they were going to want revenge. And if he doesn't do something, he's gonna have war on two borders at the same time. He has to make some big statement that will stop that from happening. Wallachia is a tiny country. They can't fight two wars. How in the world was he supposed to keep it all together and keep his kingdom going? He then invades Southern Transylvania and he decides that the only way to make sure that all of this war gets squashed at once is to make the same kind of statement in Transylvania that he did with the Saxons. So he has all 
all of the families of the people who supported Dan III publicly impaled. And this made a big statement. This was horrifying for those people. The Saxons, of course, came for revenge for what happened to their merchants. And to keep his country alive and be able to buy the supplies that he needed, Vlad had to stop paying tribute to the Ottomans. He also wasn't paying the Hungarians after he betrayed them. The Ottomans were, of course, not okay with Vlad not paying tribute and grain and soldiers. And Vlad knew it was only a matter of time before they came knocking at the door with a huge army. He was flat out sick of being bullied by everyone and decided to go up against the biggest guy in the prison yard and just punch him straight in the face. Maybe then all the bullies would just leave him alone and let them be in peace. So Vlad took his army, everyone that he had, and essentially pulled off the classic Wookiee prisoner trick by speaking Turkish, which he learned from the Ottomans, and he disguised his best warriors and somehow tricked the Ottoman guards and to letting him and his men enter one of the biggest Ottoman fortresses in the region. So he and his men took the fortress by surprise, killing all of the soldiers inside. And before the Ottomans could react, Vlad and his army rushed into Bulgaria and viciously attacked every Ottoman, deserter, and enemy supporter they could find, making sure to leave a message so horrible the Ottomans would never want to attack again. They crushed outposts, impaling everyone. If he marched into a town, he would gather all of his enemies into the town square with their families and impale all of them. If he found a group of people on the highway that were enemies, he would impale all of them and leave them in a line along the road for everyone to see. Vlad killed somewhere around 80,000 people in this campaign. 20,000 of them were impaled. And it was during this time that he earned his vampire legendary status. Because one day, supposedly, after a battle, he was eating bread surrounded by all of these impaled enemies, and he dabbed his bread in the blood of his victims as he ate. Here's the thing, though. This is all grotesque. It's bad, right? This is not good stuff. Who would do something like this? But get this. After this campaign, the Ottoman Sultan at the time, Mehmet II, gathered his armies to march against Vlad and take power in Wallachia and Transylvania. He wanted to do this once and for all. And then, if he did that, he would have an open door to march against the rest of Europe. But, as he entered into the area of Vlad's battles, he walked into a massive forest of impaled bodies. I'm not talking about a little cluster of impaled bodies. They said it was 17 stades long and seven stades wide. In today's language, that's almost two miles long by a mile wide of impaled bodies. It was over 20,000 people. When Mehmed II saw all the bodies, the women and the children who had been impaled together, and the bird's nests that had been built into the bodies, and then the birds picking at the bodies that were on all of these posts, he was so shocked by what he saw and realized how merciless Vlad the Impaler was that he retreated back to Constantinople and didn't invade again. While this brutality is infamous today and has left Vlad with that vampiric reputation, in those days when the Ottomans were the biggest threat in the known world, Vlad was hailed as a hero by everyone around him. The Wallachians loved him, Transylvania hailed him as a hero, and all of Europe absolutely adored him for what he had done. Even Pope Pius II sang his praises and declared him to be a defender of the faith. He had saved the world from the Ottoman Empire. That was kind of short-lived though, because in 1476, Vlad and a group of soldiers were ambushed and then they chopped off Vlad's head, sent it to Constantinople, and the Sultan mounted it on the main city gate because of what Vlad had done. But for the rest of the world, he was a renowned hero who had given his life Life, fighting the good fight and striking fear into the hearts of the enemy of the free world. If you like this, make sure you check out my other videos on the Middle Ages. I got a whole playlist of them. See you in the next video.